Long before we found ourselves in this bizarre era where the term fake news exists, scientists were doing battle against fake science. Dished out by all manner of self-appointed experts, such misinformation was the subject of Timothy Caulfield's book, Is Gwyneth Paltrow Wrong About Everything? When Celebrity Culture and Science Clash. And now it's got him talking about the importance of communicating real science to the public to help keep alternative facts at bay. Timothy Caulfield is Canada Research Chair in Health Law and Policy at the University of Alberta, and we are delighted to welcome him back to Upper Canada for this interview here tonight. Nice to see you again. Good to see you, Steve. Well, you were on this program, I guess the summer edition of this program, a couple of years ago, talking about that book we just mentioned and misinformation, and now I guess you were a little ahead of your time because fake news and post-truth are now mainstream. Did you see that coming? Holy cow, you know, it's incredible. It's really incredible. Now we have, you know, fake news, as you said, alternative facts, pseudoscience seems to be absolutely everywhere. I really didn't think it was going to accelerate to this extreme, but, but it has. Uh, and in addition to just accelerating, we have seen the whole argument that, that, that there's information out there that we can't trust get a lot of traction. And I think it's having a real impact on how we all talk about science, but more importantly, on, on policy. Let's compare what you spend most of your time thinking about with what we cover a lot of on this program, and that is your world of health policy and politics. Do you see similarities in terms of fake news and alternative truths and so on? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, uh, the, uh, you know, in my community, in the health community, we've been talking about how we've seen this for a long time, right? This sort of postmodern, all knowledge is relative kind of argument. You know, we've seen this for a long time in the health sector where people have argued for ridiculous kinds of treatments. Uh, and they've used the exact kind of rhetoric we're now starting to see in the political realm, right? Mm -hmm. That you can't trust the voice, that the voice has been compromised, that there are conflicts that exist that mean you shouldn't listen to a people that have particular views. Uh, yeah, so where yeah. does that come from? Where, where does the distrust of people who've spent their lives studying a particular discipline come from? Yeah, it, it's a great question. And I think part of it is what I just said. I think that the, the, the forces on the other side, whether you're talking about, about Trump or whether you're talking about someone who believes anti-vax, have been very effective arguing that there's some, there's some compromise there, that there's either a conspiracy or that they have been bought out. Uh, and there's some real reasons why people, you know, I, I think start to distrust, like the role of industry, like the role of big pharma, like the role of big food. And, and because of that, I think people have begun to distrust. You know, it's really interesting. If, you, if we went out in the street today and we asked people, uh, do you trust science? Do you trust, you know, scientific facts? Most people will say, yeah, I do, and I trust scientists too. But then if you start asking them about particular things, right, climate change, GMOs, organic food, vaccines, that trust starts to break down and they all have justifications for it. So how important is it to communicate good science? Incredibly, incredibly important. In fact, I think it's more important now than it ever has been. And I'm gonna go, so this is gonna sound like hyperbole, but I'm gonna say it anyway. <laughs> more important now than it has ever been in human history because there is so much noise out there right now. There's so many ways to communicate that noise, whether you're talking about social media, whether you're talking about pop culture more broadly, uh, whether you're talking about the old school newspapers, there's just so many ways to communicate it now and the noise is confusing. So I think we need clarity and we need the scientific community and trusted voices to step up to the plate. I appreciate that, but I wonder, you know, part of me also wonders whether or not it doesn't matter anymore. That even if yeah. you compete like hell with good science, there will be enough people out there who don't really care whether the facts are right or wrong, they just care about how they feel about something. Yeah. What do you do about that? Yeah, it's an excellent point. And, and you look at someone like Katy Perry, who has 100 million followers on, on social are you media. Kidding? Yeah, 100 uh, million. 100 million? <laughs> She's got. She's a little ahead of you and me. A little ahead. World Health Organization. So she's got 100 million. World Health Organization's got just over three million, right? So that's the world we live in, Steve, right? And so you're, you know, is it? Can we win this battle? Well, there's a little bit of evidence to suggest that, you know, we may not be able to win every battle, but perhaps we can win the war, and that's what our, our focus should be. So there is some evidence to suggest that. If scientists get on social media, if trusted voices, whether it's Health Canada or respected institutions, universities, become part of the conversation, they can shift the dialogue. And I think that, you know, it's not a huge effect, but it can have an impact on the dialogue. And I also think long term, we got to think long term, if we don't become part of the conversation, 
then the Gwyneths of the world win, right? Then Katy Perry wins. We have to, that information has to be out there and has to be accessible. Sounds to me though that we might be better off trying to draft Katy Perry into being a representative for the WHO because if she's got 100 million followers and she is a trusted source, maybe that's a good, so maybe that's a good way to let people know that vaccines are important and do work. You know, that's an interesting point, too. I mean, what it, can we sort of recruit, um, you know, let's fight mm -hmm. fire with fire, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Let's use Katie to spread the word. Uh, the problem is, you know, and there's interesting people who commented on this, uh, uh, com uh, scholar by the name of uh, Gil uh, Gilbert Welch in the United States is, has looked at, is there any role for celebrities in the context of health, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And he argues almost... All, there's almost no realm where they can do be constructive because most topics are too confusing. So, for example, he says that you, they can talk about you know wear your seatbelt, don't smoke, you know avoid junk food. But as soon as you slide into something like cancer screening, mm -hmm. it's just too complicated, too nuanced for that simple that simple voice. Uh, and I'm not saying that Katie's simple. I mean, that, but having no, uh, but she's not a trusted source yeah. on cancer treatment, obviously. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, I, I think. But look, my answer to that is. Celebrity culture is not going away. Social media is not going away. We got to figure out a way that we can use these tools in a constructive manner. So you have just said that that part of the responsibility lies in the researchers, in academia, in science, to make sure that evidence is presented in a clear and understandable fashion. How much of the responsibility is it among members of the general public to search out accurate information? Well, this is a real challenge because um, we have Twitter, we have uh, Facebook, and what these these are basically confirmation bias machines, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so people are able to construct their own reality using, and studies have shown this, right? Uh, these confirmation bubbles can be formed, so you can create a community of like-minded individuals that believe uh, exactly what you believe. The Earth is flat, yeah. and you cannot penetrate that circle. Uh, that's right. That's exactly right. And you can find, you know, a hundred thousand people that will agree with you. So I think that there is, you know, we do have to encourage people to be critical thinkers. We have to encourage people to seek out alternative views. And the interesting thing is that there was a, a study that came out very recently, I'm going to say about six weeks ago, that suggests that you can kind of have a, a rationality inoculation, so a, 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 a vaccine for critical thinking. So in other words, if you invite people, they did the study, it's hard to study this well, but if you invite people to think critically and to understand that, that there are forces twisting science, you kind of inoculate them, right? You prepare them to be critical uh, in how they, they view this information, and that can work. And so I think that we do, do need to, to create a, a, a population that is ready to do that. What's the role of journalism in all of this? Well, of course, they play a big role. You know, it's funny when I when I talk to the scientific community, uh, they often blame journalists, right? They blame the, the media. Not without I, reason. I, you're right. I, I think they're part of the story, but they're not they're not entirely the story. If you look at just twisted science, a lot of the twisted message comes from the research institutions. Mm -hmm. So, I think we have to realize this is a complex phenomenon. Uh, how when how facts get twisted? It's not just one player. There's systemic forces at play, but for sure the media is part of that story. And I think that the media can play a role in avoiding false balance, right? They can... Just explain, false balance meaning like if, if you want to discuss the state of the earth, you bring somebody on who thinks the earth is round doesn't mean you have to bring somebody on who thinks the earth is flat. That's exactly right. <laughs> exactly. The, the example I love to use is Jenny McCarthy. She's on CNN right. talking about... Uh, her anti-vax view. So it's it's Jenny McCarthy versus two people from the CDC, right? You know, and who do we remember? We remember Jenny McCarthy. I can't even remember who those PhDs were. Mm -hmm. That's false balance, right? And I think that we can try to move away from that. There's a, a, a technique called weight of evidence. And I, I would love to see the media use that more. And that is, what is the weight of the evidence on a particular topic? And even use graphics to illustrate it. So when you're talking about, are vaccines effective and safe? The evidence is here. Uh, and what's the evidence against it, either non-existent or very small? So I think that you know, doing those kinds of, using those kind of techniques, very important. Journalists also seem to do, I should say journalists. Some journalists do a pretty poor job of, you know, when they hear a single study about mm -hmm. a single thing that might be a little bit out of the norm, boy, they love to jump on that and trumpet it from the hills and get people all scared and nervous about things. What do we do about that? Uh, you're, you're right. Uh, and, and in fact, there was a study that came out very recently that showed that uh, the majority of breakthrough promises that are touted in the media are later shown to be wrong. Right. Uh, so this is a study that came out very, very recently. Um, and very, you know, a true breakthrough, it almost never happens. Right. So I think that that we do need to be cautious. So that would be another technique is mm -hmm. 
one study should be represented as something interesting. And we should always look to the body of evidence on any topic, right? Because one study is all, it's very rare that one study is going to be definitive. And particularly when you're talking about health, such a complicated topic. It's almost irresistible. I mean, we're seeing it right now in the last couple of weeks whereby, uh, I think Paolo Zamboni is how he pronounces yeah. his name. He's got, you know, he, he claims to have made great strides in treating MS. And it has now emerged that it's pretty much a placebo, that he didn't make any great breakthrough at all, and the whole thing is phony baloney. But we've basically given him millions of dollars of free coverage over the last couple of years, well, uh, last several years, saying that he made a breakthrough. How do we put that toothpaste back in the tube? Yeah, an excellent example. I mean, and that really was a, uh, a media generated yes. phenomenon yes. And, and very much I don't know if you knew this Steve very much a Canadian phenomenon you know I've tra mm -hmm. I travel the world and you bring up the liberation treatment as it's often mm -hmm. sometimes called CCSBI um, and they haven't even heard of it hmm. right so because it was very much a media story here in in Canada and uh, you know studies in 2003 showed it didn't work 2015 showed it didn't work and then most recent one from UBC again shows it does not work mm -hmm. uh, but but because as you say you know it's out of the tube the horse is out of the barn it's very hard to, to reel that back in because you start to get conspiracy theories around it and you start to get this idea that you know the big pharma's played a role or something like that mm -hmm. and there are clinics all over the world that still offer this and there are people that still believe I don't want to let journalists off the hook but the fact is you know the Zambonis of the world, the Wakefields of the world, with that study that was complete mm -hmm. bogus about how autism, you know, you can get autism from vaccines or something like this. Uh, you know, what role does bad science play in the problem we're discussing here tonight? It plays a big role. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's why I call it a hype pipeline. We, you know, this is an area that our institute does. Say it again, a hype pipeline? Hype pipeline, right? Okay, so good. because there are twisting forces, and these are systemic pressures. So often it's not even done consciously, right? But there's systemic pressures throughout this. So you have pressure to get your research grant. You have pressure to make your work sound interesting. You have pressure to put it into a high impact journal. The institutions have pressure to have exciting press releases. That um, there, Then it gets to the media. The media puts a twist on it that gets mm -hmm. to the market. All of these things twist how science is portrayed. And unfortunately, public and the policymakers are at the end of that pipeline, right? And they are the least able to actually discernibly know who's telling you the truth and who isn't. Oh, yeah. Th that's right, that's right. So what? just realizing that those forces are there, I think, is, is step one. And then trying to create incentives that can moderate those forces is step two. Let me, Timothy, read this from, this is from The Atlantic Magazine by a James Hamblin. We'll read this quote and get you to react to this. People who are not scientists tend to be better at using evocative language and less married to conservative, may be related to type caveats. The scientific establishment that guardedly posits potential correlations and ends every statement with, more studies are needed. The deferential language of careful science unfortunately lends itself to little influence on the emotion-laden mainstream internet. Language, the use of language in all of what we're discussing here today, how much does that play a role? Yeah, James makes an excellent point here, and, and I think this plays out all the time. So you'll have Gwyneth, she can say something definitive about the, her latest suggestion, or Katie, or Jenny McCarthy, or Tom Brady, you know, who has a crazy diet. They can say, make these definitive statements about it. A scientist comes in, and they're much more cautious, right? They'll say, mm. well, we don't know what a healthy diet looks like, or, or well, actually we do, that's a bad example, mm. <laughs> but we, we're not really sure about the effects of this intervention. Uh, so I think the answer, and James has actually done this, this author that you're referring to here, you know, you, we can still contribute, uh, talk about science in an accurate way um, that is still interesting. I don't think we should fight anecdote with anecdote, but we can use narratives and creative communication styles to get across the science. Do scientists therefore then have to be far more definitive in the use of the language? Um, I don't think, if, if the science isn't there, to suggest they should be definitive, they shouldn't be. I don't think that we should we should play that game, right? Because then eventually you're going to lose trust. Eventually that's going to be wrong. I, I think what we, we need to do is figure out a clever way to say what the state of the science actually is, because often it isn't defin definitive, mm -hmm. and I think we need to be transparent about that. Humor me for a second here. What's your favorite National Football League team? The New England Patriots. Who is the greatest quarterback of all time? Tom Brady. Did you just take a poke at his diet? Did you just <laughs> did you just sow a seed of doubt about the magnificence of that diet of his? Well, Tom is a great example, and it does kill me because if Tom <laughs> needed my kidney, I'd give it to him right now. <laughs> I know you would. I, 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 but but 
I, the thing about, about Tom Brady is a great example because here is this magnificent anecdote, yeah. right? And he talks about his diet and his book sells out, right? Even though there's no, he breaks my heart, right? You know, he's testing my faith. Uh, there's no evidence to support it. But it, it's a wonderful example of the power of celebrity, of the power of an anecdote versus what the evidence actually says. And there's actually been a systematic review that came out of the University of Calgary on the alkaline diet, which is the diet he That's proposes. What he does, which yeah. means what? He does what? He, he doesn't eat any nightshades. He doesn't drink any dairy. Uh, he ha or eat any dairy. Uh, he eats only very particular kind, no caffeine. Mm. Uh, can you believe that? Um, so a very restricted diet, uh, and this and this systematic review ha that came out of the University of Calgary has shown that it, no evidence to support it. Except who's going to win, the systematic review or Tom Brady? Well, I was going to say, except that he's a forty-year-old, five-time Super Bowl champion, which they don't grow on trees. Last yeah. I checked, yeah. so and, people are going to look for any explanation they can. Yeah, you're a, that's a very important point, and and that's the power of his story, right? And then how is that portrayed in the media? I, you know, as you can imagine, I think I've read every single one of those <laughs> articles, uh, and they all say, well, the proof is in his performance, right? Of course, <laughs> it works because it works for Tom Brady. Except that's not true, right? The proof is not in the performance. That's there, right. There, there must be other metrics by which you determine whether or not that diet makes any sense at all. Yeah, th and this is very important, I think, because uh, we need to not only communicate what science is, but what science is not. And science is not anecdote. Science are not uh, testimonials. That's not real data. And you know what else isn't real data is personal experience, right? You can't say, oh, well, it worked for me. You know what? That's not data. That's right? not science, is That's it? That's not science. Now, if 50,000 people said, that Brady diet works for me. Is that then science? You know, in a way, no. Because uh, a bunch of anecdotes bundled together also doesn't make good science. Okay. What you would need to do is you would need to take uh, 20, or let's say even bigger, the, I will guess the you know, 100 quarterbacks and, uh, and another 100 and put them on different diets and then control all the variables and then you'll find out what impact did this actual diet have. It's, and, and to be honest with you, Diet, you know, nutrition studies are difficult, right? Because there are so many variables. Hmm. And um, yeah, so it's very, very difficult to do it, but I can t guarantee that one, that one glorious anecdote named Tom Brady <laughs> is not science. <laughs> All right, in which case, how hopeful are you that in the end, and I don't know when that is, but let's just say it's coming, science and evidence are going to win out in this debate? Um, you know, I, I, I'm an optimistic person, and so I think that long term, eventually, science always wins. And a lot of these forces, a lot of these forces just uh, make that process more inefficient, right? So the hype and the bad science and the studies that we can't replicate. I like to believe that long term, eventually, science wins. And, and if you look at the progress of, of humanity, that's the direction of the arrow. Yeah, but before the long term, well, first of all, in the long term, we're all dead. So that's yeah. number one. <laughs> number two, you know, Sometimes the long term takes an awfully long time to get to. Look what Galileo had to go through, right? So we can go through decades upon decades of false news in science before we get to your long term. That's not healthy. Uh, you're right about that. And that's why I think we need to grapple with this issue right now and try to create incentives that allow us to accelerate the science is right phenomenon, right? Uh, I, I think that we need to develop communication strategies to, to combat the, this this phenomenon. Uh, and I also hope that we incentivize and encourage scientists and people who are interested in this to speak out and become part of the part of the public conversation. Look, not every scientist is going to be interested in that, but I think I hope we can encourage th those that are interested to speak out, right, and to become part of the conversation. Hmm. What are your kids' names? Adam, Allison, Jane, and Michael. There's not a single Brady among them? <laughs> You're not that big a fan, my friend. You're not that big a fan if you don't have a kid named Brady. Uh, they, were still, too, they were too old. There's so. still time for you to have a fifth. <laughs> Timothy, it's good of you to visit us here at TVO again. Thanks so much. We always appreciate your contributions to our program, and good luck with the whole post-truth thing, which we're fighting with all we can here. Thanks very much, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.